Thank you guys for joining us with Wallston Baptist Church. Uh, I know many people are seeing church in a completely different way uh, today, and we're thankful for technology to be in a place where we can spread God's news, and we don't have to be one-on-one, -on -one or uh, we can actually maybe reach more people than ever before. And so thankful for this opportunity that uh, we're able to preach God's Word, to teach God's Word in a way that is... Uh, being reached by so many people across the country and across the world. So we're going to be looking at today uh, the word of Revelation, the book of Revelation. And uh, we're looking at it uh, in not of a preaching way, but a teaching way, kind of a Bible study way. We're going to be walking through in the next couple weeks and possibly months uh, at the book of Revelation, what it means. Uh, there's a lot of thought about Revelation, a lot of disagreement about Revelation. There's a lot of uh, ideas and speculation about when the end is coming or if it's already passed or what Revelation means. And we're just going to look at basically the four major views of Revelation today. So if you would turn with me to Revelation 1 and the four main ideas and four main uh, thought processes on Revelation would be number one, the idolist, uh, idealist uh, thought. And that's uh, that there's no set of events in Revelation, but it's in the grand, grand scheme of things, it's a battle through history. It's a battle through time. It's a battle through the future of good versus evil. And it's generationally that we're going to continue fighting this battle until eventually Christ comes and returns. Uh, this was kind of really started up in about eight, uh, 185 AD after death. And really made prominent by Augustine. He he really took on to this idolistic view of Revelation and that uh, there's going to be constant evil and constant good and they're going to be battling uh, for the ages and ever age. We will see different battles and different uh, afflictions to the people and that through the word uh, that we don't necessarily see uh, certain indicators that we're, we're in the time that we're in now, but all indicators are for every generation for every era and the idolists uh believe that you know that floods tornadoes things are like that you know a lot of them believe that this could be a reflection of god's wrath on sin and different things like that so we're going to be looking at each of these that's the first one and just so you know in each one of these categories there's a hundred other views you know like there's people who uh see a little bit of this way and a little bit of that way and uh, the Revelation is left up to so much interpretation that uh, a lot of these actually even have crossovers, you know. But we're focused on the four points. The first one, like I said, is idolist. The second one, uh, it's like a pre-list. Like he, he's looking at uh, the past as in Revelation's already been fulfilled. A lot of these believe that, uh, that we're already in a thousand-year reign, that right now is the thousand-year reign. Uh, that we're with Christ, with Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, that we're with Him now. There's two different people, uh, two different main groups in this pre-list, uh, pre-tree list. One's the full, it's already been fulfilled, that we're already in heaven, and one is the partial, and that meaning that they are uh, believing that the first part of Revelation has already been completed, and then the second half is yet to come. So, uh, like I said, as you go through these, you might find yourself... In several of these groups or you know you may be focused in one group and we're going to be looking at the whole text to the kind of define why each one of these believe what they believe and uh, the pros and cons to each one and so the third one is the historist uh, it's kind of each church is led by a different era as we go through the first few chapters of Revelation we'll be reading about seven churches and the historialist believes that each one of these churches is a representative of a different era in uh, biblical times. You know, we you have different eras of which the church is going through, different periods of which uh, you see the kind of the prologue of the church going up to the era that we may be in now. And so they believe that uh, basically it started with the Roman Empire, and it went to the Roman Catholics, and that uh, a lot of this involves the battle between uh, Christians and the Roman Catholics, and eventually leading up to uh, the Catholic 
church and the judgment of God. And these, this was very popular with uh, John Calvinist or John Calvin, C.H. Uh, Spurgeon, uh, Martin Luther, uh, a lot of these for the, uh, you know, during that time, it was really a popular thing to believe. Uh, today, uh, we see a much reformed vision of that. We see uh, the kind of what we see now is the futurist, and it's probably the most popular today where, you know, it's a literal translation. You know, we're looking through this, and this was kind of really brought to popularity, I believe, by the movie and books, you know, Left Behind, where you kind of seen the rapture, or you've seen uh, different aspects of what that looked like, and it's kind of a more modern view on Revelation. Now, with the uh, C.H. Spurgeon, Martin Luther, and John Calvin, uh, during that time, you know, it was really important, and you had to look at the events that were happening with the Reformation, uh, you know, with the Catholics and the Protestants, and all the things that were going on there. And we'll look at some of that as we go through the book of Revelation. Now, the Revelation, just to start the book, you know, with the name, you know, what does it mean? We're looking at the Greek word, uh, talking about apocalypse. And really, uh, we take a lot from that word, but really what it means is the revealing or the unveiling. And so uh, let's read through this, and we will see what we're being revealed. And so it says, read the first chapter of Revelation. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so as we just said a moment ago, uh, you know, that means the revealing, the unveiling. So the, the unveiling, the revealing of Jesus Christ, which God had given to show him his servants, the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to the servant of John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Even to all that he saw, blessed are those who read aloud the words of his prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And for the seven spirits who are before his throne, in Jesus Christ, the faithfulness, the witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on the earth. We're going to stop there just for a moment. When we look at John to the seven churches are in Asia. Uh, so this seven churches are speaking about, you know, when we looked at the four different groups of uh, beliefs of Revelation, the historialists, you know, they, they're they going to be looking at this different than the idolist, where, uh, you know, historialists are going to believe that each one of these seven churches are a different age, and that these ages, some have passed and some are, maybe present, some are still to come. And I ask for you, for you watching at home, please leave any comments or thoughts about this and your thing. You know, I, you know, a lot of people, Revelation divides, and I believe it's something that, uh, it shouldn't determine our salvation. You know, there's nothing in Revelation that I see uh, that dictates our salvation. Our salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. And, you know, hopefully we can talk about Revelation in a way that, brings us closer together that allows us to maybe disagree but have uh the same brotherly love uh, that we would about anything else and so this isn't something i believe that we should be fighting about but rather that we should have great conversation about and great uh talks about and i'm hoping that's what we have here uh with this first reading of revelation so reading the seven churches we see two main views one as that these churches were in Asia, uh, Asia Minor, and they were churches during this point in time. These were seven individual churches. We see that these churches are through the New Testament with different people uh, leading them, as such as Paul and uh, different disciples and apostles going to these churches. And the first view is that these churches were struggling during this time, and this was a letter to those churches warning them you know, about the things they were struggling with and the things to come. The second view is, as I said a moment ago, that these churches are uh, some in the past and some are still to come. And some are what we're sitting right now. Some believe that uh, the church today in this era is the final church that the Bible is talking about. Now, what I want to focus on today is the spirits. I think this is interesting. It says, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits 
who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness from the firstborn of the dead, and to the ruler of kings of all the earth. You know, when it talks about these seven spirits, we're going to be looking through the whole book of Revelation where it talks about things in the number seven. You know, through the whole book of, of the Bible, we see uh, different numbers that represent that this is from God, that this is ordained from God, that this is God's word, that this is from God. We've seen this. We've been studying Peter here. We see the number three repeatedly shown through Peter's life. Well, uh, the number seven is shown throughout the Bible more than any other number. And as we read through Revelation, we're going to see it points back to the Old Testament more than any other book. And so, if you would, we're going to try to dissect what, who and what these seven spirits are. And we're going to start in Isaiah. So if you would, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11. And we will look at verses 2 and 3 and see what it talks about these seven spirits. So I'm going to start reading from verses 1, but we're going to see the, the fruit in 2 and 3. These shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and in his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by his eyes see or decide disputes by his ears hear but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equality of the meek of the heart of the earth and he shall strike the earth with rod in his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked righteous shall be the belt of his waist so when we're really looking at the spirits it's uh, focused in two and three uh so we see the spirit of wisdom and understanding we see the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and then we see the fear of the Lord twice. And that fear of the Lord the first time is actually talking about uh, the godliness. And if you translate, there's two different words there. The fear is two different words. The first fear talks about the godliness of the Lord. And so we see seven different spirits here. And uh, some believe that these are the exact same seven spirits that it's talking about in Revelation. That these are the same seven spirits that are surrounding uh, God and Jesus on the throne. Now, when we look at these spirits, we can say that these are things that the Holy Spirit provides us. And with the Holy Spirit, when we accept Jesus Christ, when it enters our body, uh, that we already have some of these things, but he greatly produces their power. You know, he gives us wisdom. He gives us understanding. He gives us counsel and might. He gives us fear of the Lord. He gives us the godliness of the Lord. And so when we think about that, uh, you know, I think that a lot of times in America and around the world, we don't have a healthy fear of the Lord. You know, we have put him on a, on a friendship term so much that we don't have a healthy fear of uh, what he does and what he can do. And uh, he loves us. He loves us unconditionally. But he also tells us that uh, through his love, if, if we're disobedient, that he will... Uh, give us reprimand. He will recommend us, and you know through that, you know punishment. Uh, he says if he doesn't punish us, then he doesn't love us. And so a lot of people, uh, you know, they kind of leave that out. They don't think about that in a way. But uh, you know that fear of the Lord is something important. And of course, you know the wisdom, understanding, counsel, and might. All these things are very important parts of the Holy Spirit. The Second part of this is the seven graces. A lot of people believe that these spirits may be the seven graces that we see in Romans 12. So if you would, turn with me to Romans 12 and we'll be looking at verses 6 through 8. And I think that these kind of line up with one another. And it says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them in prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in his generosity, the one who leads with his zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And so we see seven different traits, seven different habits. And, you know, I think they go along with the book of Isaiah. I think that, you know, the spirits of Isaiah, the, you know, the spirit 
and these uh, gifts, you know, they're very similar. And when we look at Revelation, you know, we're going to see some things that it's talking about in these spirits. So I think this is uh, an accurate description maybe of these seven spirits that we see with the Lord Jesus. You know, when we think about prophecy, you know, we'll see that later on in Revelation it says the young will prophesy. Uh, you know, we see through Isaiah, you know, the prophecy of things to come. So prophecy is a major portion of the Bible and something that uh, we don't think about in today's time. And then we look at service and teaching, uh, it, you know, generosity and those who lead with cheerfulness. And we look at these seven things, and they're all things that uh, that portray uh, Christ, uh, that give us things that we should be faithful in. The next thing uh, that is often talked about in the seven spirits is uh, that there are actually seven spirits themselves, that there are seven spirits of authority. And uh, if you would, turn with me to Ephesians uh, 3. And verse 10, and as we look at this, we'll see this word authorities, and there's lots of other verses that talk about authorities and powers to be, but we're just going to look at a few of these. So that through the church, that manifold wisdom of God might know, be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So this is, uh, this is unique. Because it says, "Thou, uh, so that thou, church, that manifold wisdom of God might be known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So it's saying heavenly places, there's in rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So that means that almost there's a type of government, there's a system in place. And we're looking at uh, these spirits as a way uh, possible of authorities in heaven. Uh, the second one, or the I'm sorry, the fourth one. Some believe that they're actually angels, uh, that these are seven spiritual angels that surround Jesus, and that uh, these angels are, you know, the reason uh, that they got us. If, if we go on into Revelations, we'll see something about uh, the churches. So if you would, turn with me back to Revelation 1, and as we read... Uh, you know, we'll, we'll start back at John to the seven churches that are in Asia. This is verse 4. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ is the faithfulness witness from the firstborn of the dead and to the rulers of the kings of, on the earth. To him who loves and freed us from our sins by his blood, made us kingdoms, priests to his God and Father, to be him glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming to the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will well and account, even so him. Amen. I am the Alpha, the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, Almighty. And then we come into uh, where it talks about John. I, John, your brothers and partners in the tribulation, the kingdom and patience, endurance there are Jesus, was on the island called Patmos. Now, this is John, the same John that would be referred to as writing the Gospel of John in 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. He tells us, I was in the spirit of the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Samaria and to Parum and uh, Triarita and to Saratus and Philadelphia and uh, Laodicea. Then I turned to see him, the voice that was speaking to me, and turning to seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe with golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, the white wool like snow. His eyes were like that of a uh, flame of fire. His feet were like uh, burnished bronze, refined and furnished. And his voice was like that roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a two and sword, and his face was like that of the sun shining in full strength. When him, when I saw him, I fell at his feet through dead. But the, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, "Fear not, I am the first, the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I live forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Right therefore, the things that you have seen, that are those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars and the in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, 
The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So we have two figurative speeches here. Uh, one being he's telling us about seven stars in his right hand and seven golden lampstands. Uh, and he's telling us what those mean. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the lampstands are the seven churches. Now, uh, so it's very possible that the seven spirits that are surrounding uh, Christ, as we see in uh, verses 4, the seven spirits who are among the, his throne, these could be the very same angels that he's talking about in uh, verses 20, as he's telling us about the, the purpose of the golden lampstands and the purpose of the seven stars. Now, as we continue to look through the Bible, we see a lot of indications that this is a special moment for John. You know, at this moment in time, he was on the island of Patmos and all hope had been lost. Uh, everything that he knew, everybody that he knew uh, had been taken away from him. He was on an island with isolation. Um, all of his brothers and sisters uh, and the apostles that were spreading God's word with him had been killed. And so really, he was alone in a lot of ways. And I could imagine when they sent him to the island of Patmos that he had a lot of anger. He didn't understand. You know, his sole mission was spread God's news, his good news. And through that, he didn't feel like he was ever able to do that again. And this just tells you that God can use all circumstances for his good. You know, he never thought that on this island by himself that he could possibly spread the word of God. And here he is uh, prophesizing, telling us things uh, that are to come. And God is using John here for his good, even though that he is isolated. And when we read through the rest of the chapters of Revelation, we're going to come to an end now. But I want you to think about what it's like to prophesy. I want you to think about John. And, uh, you know, what if God revealed to us something that was to happen thousands of years in the future? So as you see things and hear things in Revelation, you know, imagine them through the eyes of John, who he's literally seeing things that he's never saw before. You know, he's seeing the future. Uh, he's seeing things he can't describe. And so uh, really, we want to look at the words when he's describing some of the things in the next few chapters of what they look like, what they can mean, and what they meant to John. Because like I said, you know, John is seeing pictures that, you know, he had never seen before. And God is showing them to him and revealing those to him in the form of prophecy and vision. So I ask you this week to, you know, study, to work hard, to continue to serve God, uh, let's not forget, you know, what it means to uh, be in God's word. You know, let's take this time not to neglect our responsibilities as churches, but uh, if there's ever a time a need for a church, it's now. And so think of the ways that you can help others and maybe restrict your uh, contact with others, but still not give up that duty as Christians to encourage others, to supply others, and and this time of need to take care of those who need that need. And I think that in the next few weeks and months, there's going to be a lot more need for us, for the church, for each and every individual uh, that is serving the Lord Jesus, and that we don't neglect that. You know, I think the one thing I hope that we don't take out of this is uh, that this technology to be able to spread the word of Jesus becomes the replacement for gathering together and gathering in fellowship. And we we can't forsake the fellowship, and we, we need to keep that uh, in the back of our minds. And as this thing comes to an end, you know, that we don't take for granted that we can see on Facebook Live or uh, that we can turn on our TV, and that's the same as coming together in fellowship. It's, it's not, and we're in a time where that may be a necessity, but when that time ends, I, I just uh, ask of you to, to continue to coming back to churches and also... You know, with our tithing, uh, you know, during this time where we're not going to church, it's so important that we continue to tithe. And one of my fears is that a lot of churches, uh, with the members not coming to them, they, they won't ever be able to open their doors again. So I, uh, I ask you to, to make sure that you're tithing to your, your local church, that you're still giving offerings to your local churches, because they're still doing the Word of God. They're still 
uh, filling the needs of the need of, of the people in the world. And, you know, I think, you know, just for instance, our church this week, you know, we've taken food and water and other things to people in need. And, you know, we want to continue to do that. And other churches want to continue to do that. And we can't do that uh, without the, the tithing of the church. So uh, let's not take for granted uh, that this is going to continue like this, that we're going to stay... Uh, on Facebook Live, that we're going to stay on a on a uh, virtual sermon, but you know, rejoice in the fact when we can come back together as brothers and sisters in Christ and study His Word and worship together. So, if you would, let's uh, close your eyes and bow our heads and pray together, and just pray for our country, pray for our leaders, and pray for one another. Dear Heavenly Father, we gather for you today, Lord, and we're so thankful for this opportunity to be able to come and worship you, Lord. And even though it's through a virtual world, Lord, we're uh, people are seeing us not in person, but, you know, through a screen, we, we still hope that your word gets carried in a way that would be pleasing to you. Lord, we ask you to continue to guide us, to direct us, to love us, and encourage us. Lord, give us wisdom. Give us these seven spirits that we're talking about in Isaiah. Give us the, the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, the courage and wisdom and the teaching to, to do what is needed to be done. And Lord, we just want to pray for our leaders. Lord, we know that our leaders are, are ordained by you, Lord, and they've been put in power by you and you use all things uh, for your good. And we just ask you to guide their decision-making, guide their uh, their decisions. And uh, Lord, let you get the glory for all, all things that happen. And Lord, we just ask you to continue to be with those that are sick and be with those families who are uh, in quarantine and lord we know that many people are in difficult situations and lord let us as a church come together to to serve those and to continue to uh, be a lighthouse in times of trial and devastation and lord we just love you and we thank you that you're our father and our god and we're just so proud to be able to serve you in the ways that we do and it's in jesus name we pray amen